All right, um, welcome to the DDPS seminar, everyone. Uh, before we introduce our invited speaker, let's go over some rules as usual. First of all, please mute yourself during the talk. If you have immediate questions, you're welcome to unmute and ask. Or otherwise, please use the chat room to post your questions so that we can address them in the Q&A session at the end. Second, today's seminar is open to external audience, so no classified discussion is allowed. Finally, the talk will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel. Now, let me introduce our speaker. It is an honor to host Eduardo Gildin, who is currently a professor of petroleum engineering at the Texas A&M University and is the holder of the LF Peterson 36 professorship in petroleum engineering. He received his PhD from the, Texas, uh, the University of Texas at Austin in aerospace engineering and has held postdoctoral positions with Rice University and UT Austin. His research has been supported by grants from NSF, DOE, DOD, NASA, and industry, with main topics in physics-based and data-driven reduced order modeling for reservoir simulation and optimization, and drilling modeling control and automation. He was inducted to, into the SPE Distinguished Membership in 2021. Today, he will talk about guided deep learning manifold linearization of porous media flow equations for digital twin operations. Please enjoy the wonderful talk. Now, without further ado, let me head it to um, Dr. Gildin by asking a random question. So, where is the, um, your, the place that you like the most in Brazil? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say my, my home country, my, my home city, Sao Paulo. Oh, is it like full of like beach and sun, sunlight? Well, well, I mean, as as people say in Brazil, you gotta go to Rio de Janeiro during the day and São Paulo during the night. So that's uh. <laughs> oh, I see. I see. Sounds good. So uh, yeah, the the stage is now yours. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you, thank you, Tony, for the nice introduction. Thank everyone for joining my uh, my seminar. It's a, it's a pleasure and honor to be here. And I, you know, I've been watching uh, many of those the uh, DDPS uh, seminars myself, and I really liked it. And uh, you guys are doing really great on on that spectrum. Um, so let let me uh, talk a little bit about what I've been doing in the last uh, few years. Uh, my research uh, on mod reduction has been going on for many, many years now, but uh, we are moving a little bit on the, you know, trying to put things on the digital twin perspective. Uh, and I'm going to show to you a couple of things that we are doing. Uh, I'll start up with a, uh, the idea of digital twin, at least in, uh, from a drilling, perspective, drilling engineering perspective. Then we're going to move on to reservoir engineering. So that we set the uh, the stage for what I mean by digital twins operation. Uh, this is a joint work, uh, at least on the, the visualizations and the, uh, the digital twin framework with uh, John Tao from the visualization department, and on the uh, um, uh, you know the, uh, the the machine learning, scientific machine learning with uh, Ulysses Braganetta from the electrical engineering here at A and M, uh, and many other my students. Uh, you know I. You know, many of the, the work that I'm going to pre pre be presenting is from Emilio, uh, who is now at Petrobras in Brazil, Marcelo, who is now at ExxonMobil, uh, Narendra, that is McKinsey, and Enrique, that is a postdoc here, and Levi, that's a postdoc as well with uh, Dr. Braganetto, and uh, other students that are being, being working on, on that. Okay, so um, uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on uh, the the why we are doing this, uh, I think this uh, the uh, the seminar series, uh, the, at least from what we are watching here, uh, explains really well why model reduction and uh, other things are important. But from my perspective, uh, we are going to a new wave of uh, um, you know implementations of uh, porous media flow. And then, uh, you know, given that, uh, you know, we, uh, there's uh, CCUS, uh, hydrogen storage, uh, geothermal, and even uh, hydrocarbon production, right? Uh, you know, these net zero emissions uh, paradigm, uh, it's important, but uh, we all know that, uh, you know, in some ways, petroleum engineers are on the subsurface. And uh, that's a quote that I get from a faculty here at A&M is very much into uh, subsurface as well. Um, so, uh, and that's why we still keep in do, uh, doing what, uh, what I'm doing on, uh, on the subsurface flows. 
Okay, but there is a commonality between all these uh, issues here, and it, it can be CCUS, uh, geothermal, hydrocarbon, or, or uh, hydrogen storage, as you may know. Uh, they all have a uh, you know uncertainty related to everything, not only uh, technical, political, economical, but uh, uh, everything that we do in that realm, right? Um, and they all part of uh, you know family of large scale simulation problems right uh, we are uh, using somehow a, a subsurface flow simulation for prediction and they are computationally expensive right and not only that uh, you know it's not about only simulating but it's about getting an answer and an answer meaning a fast and robust way to obtain an optimized answer whatever optimized mean uh, i'm not going to the optimization process itself here in my talk but uh, no optimization can mean uh, minimize risks can be uh, increased storage for co2 for instance production and anything that you want but the problem is that uh, we are calling this uh, simulator many many times you need a uh, you know a way to 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 you know to get a, a fast answer out of that okay so that's the 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 the, 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 the idea here and not only that um, one uh, interesting article that uh, was posted in the JPT was, uh, you know, a couple of years ago. And you can say that it's a little, it's a little bit old, yeah, already. But uh, no, they they talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the the one way to solve uh, the issues uh, using, uh, you know, moving forward with this uh, transition. It is that we're going to have to digitize a lot more. Uh, the the operations uh, of things that we do nowadays, right? And uh, that's why I uh, moved on to a little bit on the digital twin concept in energy, which is not new, right? If you look at, uh, you know, uh, there was a paper published in 2018 uh, that actually talked about the last 10 years, you know, back then, the last 10 years of a digital twin in energy, right? And, uh, you know, back then were, you know, mostly on replication of uh, platforms and the operation itself. Uh, uh, annotated, uh, I, okay, so something popped up here from annotation. I don't know what uh, what is that, but uh, anyway. Uh, uh, so, just one second. So, uh, uh, no, even for uh, turbines and everything. So the, the digital twin concept is not new. Right. So let, let let me show what that we're actually doing on that real. Okay. Um, the problem that happens in the last uh, no five ten years is that you know when I joined A and M thirteen years ago, I used to see it on uh, many of the uh, industry uh, board uh, you know uh, meetings, and uh, faculty used to complain a lot that the companies wouldn't give data. Right. We don't have data. We don't have the data. Now, now we have a new problem. Right, which is that the companies actually everybody want to give data, and we don't know what to do with that data. So the the old rhetoric that uh, we don't have enough data may not apply anymore. And you can see that uh, you know in drilling operations we are getting uh, you know information on the bit, and this is a Halliburton Cerebro uh, drill bit that you can get uh, you know accelerometers and uh, other uh, measurements directly on the bit with a thousand hertz of frequency. Right, so it's a lot of data. We have a D, uh, you know, distributed acoustic and distributed temperature sensing that you have gigabytes of data, terabytes of data being shipped to the uh, uh, you know, along the well, right? And we don't know what to do with this this data, right? So somehow we need a some form of a data reduction, mod reduction, and a combination of those things to actually implement things on the digital twin framework. Okay. All right. Let, let me let me just give you a glimpse of one thing that we are doing on the drilling side, then we're gonna move on to the uh, reservoir side. And that's a, a joint work with a uh, Gentile, the one that I mentioned before. Um, and that way we're trying to do a digital twin for drilling uh, optimization problems, okay? Um, I'm not gonna go into details on the drilling itself, but basically we have a drilling machine right here. And we instead of, uh, you know, the problem is very complicated, prohibitively expensive. Uh, to simulate everything. So what we are focusing, we're focusing on the drill bit, the BHA simulation here, okay? So for, just think about that we are right at this tip of this uh, the drill bit, 
right? And of course, uh, we have data from, uh, you know, information from logs, information from uh, how the structure of the geological media works. And we're going to try to employ a digital twin to recreate the environment and the platform for further drilling. Okay, so that's, um, and as I mentioned, we're going to just focus on the, uh, the, the BHA, right? The BHA, so we are modeling this into to this BHA framework. All right, so let me show you a quick video. If it is uh, pops up, hopefully it will. Of our digital twin implementation for drilling uh, optimization, and that's basically um, a real time drilling operation, in, uh, getting real time data from a, a system. We have here a miniaturized drilling machine, so that's why we get the real time data, right? But anyway, so the, the focus here is not drilling per se. So let me just close this and uh, uh, move on, hopefully. Uh, uh, let me just close this and move on up on this one. And basically what we implemented here is a reinforcement learning for, uh, you know, um, trajectory steering on, on this drilling uh, drilling machine. Okay, so there's a paper coming up, but the, the nice thing about that, we can optimize and everything. But as I said, the problem is not drilling per se. And the thing is that uh, drilling is just a small part of this digital twin operation that we wanna do, right? I'm gonna, for the interest of time, I'm gonna come back to this in the end, if I have time, I'm gonna show the trajectories like later in the end. But the idea is that uh, in real time operations, we wanna put together not only the drilling itself, right? We want to put together a reservoir characterization model. We want to put together a fast reservoir simulation model, and we want to have a certainty associated with that as well, right? So it's a, it's a much more complicated problem just, just going to a, a game like, and if you look at the, what we've done, we, we use a, a game uh, engine framework, right? To develop our, uh, our digital twin for, for drilling. But for reservoir, that's a different story. Right. There's a little bit more complication uh, going from uh, simulation of this this entire loop, right? Um, okay, so uh, but in my perspective, right, we already have something. Right? A digital a reservoir simulator is a digital twin by by nature, right? If you look at uh, what we are doing in the digital twin, right, we are replicating the effect of uh, a, a, a certain things, right, with real time data. And, and the problem with a, uh, a reservoir simulation to become a digital twin is exactly that the digital twin requires real-time data integration into this virtual environment. And if you look at this problem here, this is a UNICIN benchmark from a, a Brazilian uh, uh, university, UNICAMP, one can take a look at. But if you look at uh, you know, just this small problem here, right? Uh, we have a, uh, about uh, you know, uh, 1 billion of states well, what I mean, pressures and saturations and concentrations and so, and so forth, right? With, uh, you know, if you're gonna optimize with about 1500 variables to optimize. So we need to do something else with that, uh, that simulation to, became, to, to be able to do a digital twin framework. And there's enablers to, that does that. It is exactly model reduction and data-driven modeling, at least in my perspective, right? So, uh, so let me let me let, let me let me go to that direction now, and let me show what we are doing to do this mod reduction for reservoir uh, simulation perspective, right? And I, I I know suffice to say that uh, you know uh, you know reservoir simulation is a uh, is a, it's a hard thing to do, and as as I mentioned, you're looking at uh, you know a couple partial differential equations, uh, lots of states variables, lots of control variables, and so forth. Okay. Let me just, uh, you know, this slide here serves for you to know what are the states that we are looking at, pressures and saturations for this uh, reservoir, okay? Uh, but as far as the output goes, right, the one look at uh, oil rates, uh, water rates, uh, you can do, uh, you know, CO2 rates and, and so forth. Um, and usually this is handled by what's called Pissman equation here. It's a semi-empirical equation right here. And that's a one part of the issue that we are trying, going to try to solve later on in my, my slide, it is how we handle actually this output, okay? This output with uh, you know, most of the model reduction techniques that are out there, they only look at state, 
right? They never looked at the output by itself. And if you're going to couple this with a, an optimizer, output is the most important thing that one has to look at. Okay, so just keep that in, in perspective. All right, so what is the model reduction problem? Uh, model reduction problem is actually trying to, you know, determine uh, a replica of that, uh, you know, fine scale model that uh, one can have outputs, uh, you know, uh, almost equal, right? Outputs almost equal, right? And the machinery that you go through to do that, it depends upon uh, if you want to do physics based, if you want to do uh, data driven, and so forth. Okay. All right. So, what is the approach that we have taken in the past? Okay, the approach is a, is the classical approach of uh, you know uh, projection-based model reduction, and that's basically if you have a uh, you know an equation like this it can be a, a reservoir simulation, it can be the reservoir equation, right? Um, we assume that we can project right these uh, states, large-scale system states, into a much smaller subspace right here, uh, using this phi, which we call projection. Right, and we can uh, project this. That's a uh, you know the classical approach, and we can get uh, you know a reduced order modeling out of that. Okay, and that's the you know many many people have have done that. We have several papers on that, uh, uh, but there are issues with that implementation. It is that uh, you know one 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 thing one look at uh, this nonlinear function. Uh, and of course, uh, being a nonlinear function, one can, uh, you know, doesn't have a, uh, the, the, when you project this, you still have to go back to the full scale system to actually solve the system. And this somewhat been fixed with a, uh, the discrete imperial interpolation or some kind of uh, uh, interpolation in uh, on that nonlinear space, right? But the problem as well, it is that uh, there is a second issue. There is no output information uh, used on this uh, on this translation here. Okay, so that's one thing that we're going to try to fix. Right? Um, another, you know, projection-based model reduction is really nice. You can get a uh, you know, really good, uh, uh, you know, reduction. And uh, uh, you know, I haven't tried yet uh, Libron myself, and I know that you guys have a uh, a good understanding of that. But uh, projection-based model reduction per se, it is not a robust way of solving the problem. Why? Because uh, no, here is a, you know, uh, if you have a, let's say, a reservoir, it's a cartoon-like with the wells here, these X dots. Uh, what happens if you move a well from a place to another place? Your reducer model completely breaks down. Okay, there's, there's no way to, uh, you know, at least in the classical approach, there's no way to handle that. The, the, the dynamical system is completely different. Okay, of course, I mean, and, and as well, if you drill a new well or if you open and close these wells, things uh, uh, breaks down. And the problem is exactly how to handle these boundary conditions, right? Because the boundary, if, if you have an offline training process, right? And uh, the classical approach, you know, if you do uh, SVD, right? On the online approach, the boundary conditions are completely different. Right? So we somehow have to some have a form of adaptivity to do that, and we worked a little bit on the, on that uh, in the paper many many years ago with uh, Yao Chinefaniev from the math department. That somehow you know adaptively we you know try to solve uh, you know reconstruct that basis, but it's still you need a fast solver to reconstruct the basis, and uh, back then we used a multi-scale type of solver. And uh, you know it, it's nice, but uh, you know if you're gonna go and apply this uh, for much larger problems, that may not be the the, the way to go. Okay, so uh, here's an example of a uh, a classical uh, you know physics-based model reduction applied to a uh, hydraulic fracturing process with a couple flow and geomechanics. Right. Um, if you only look at, uh, you know, here you have a well, uh, two wells, actually parallel wells with a, uh, and we tested out from eight to 24 fractures. Here in the eight to 24 is uh, how many fractures you have in here. And you take a class, uh, you take a, you know, snapshots of pressures, saturations, and uh, this, uh, and, uh, uh, um, and, and, and uh, the, um, Displacement, sorry, the, the, the measurements of the displacements, and you go through this physics space, and you get a good uh, speed up here, 
uh, and you can see that as more fracture that you get, more speed up that you get, exactly because there is a, uh, a, a there's overhead associated with the process. So the more fracture that you get, of course, there will be a, a higher speed up on, on the process. As I mentioned, if we do some changes on this, things will break down, and that's why we, I, I, I always in my paper they say when it works, it works really well. Right, and they're still not robust yet for for uh, lots of tweaking and here and there. Okay, all right. So, so what are the existing solutions that we are looking at and uh, what we are going through? Okay, so many of these things have already been you know done in the, or been published. Right, uh, POD DAME, TPWL, dynamic mode decomposition, neural nets, uh, E2C that we're going to talk to, uh, explore a little bit more, and uh, lifting bilinearizations. Okay, um, some of them they have uh, good uh, handling, some of them they have gaps, right? So what I'm going to show to you in the next uh, maybe 20 minutes or so is a combination of these methodologies. Okay, in particular, you're going to show uh, E2CO. Uh, I'm going to show something in bilinearization. That's basically the title of the uh, the, um, the the talk today. Okay. All right. So if you go back to the reservoir equation, right, and uh, the PD equation, you can uh, write up a discretized form, right, and, and these discretized forms can be written up on this framework here that I call a a, a classical uh, system framework, right, where A, B, C, D can be our matrices, and they are not necessarily constant matrices. They are a function of the time, right? <laughs> and that's part of the the, the nonlinear uh, you know problem associated with these these, these equations, right? But the question is, <laughs> if one can write this up these equations by hand, you solve the problem, right? Um, it's really hard to do that, especially. Uh, because you have a very nonlinear problem that you don't know how to, you got to go and get uh, all these Jacobians and so forth inside the system. So building up this matrix is A, B, C, D. Uh, it is important. And if you can do that without accessing the, the simulator code, um, it would be really nice. So the, the hypothesis here, it is that uh, one, can we estimate those matrices based, based upon only a dynamic evolution of the state? Okay. It turns out that it's possible. It's possible if you look at uh, what's called embedded to control, okay? And embedded to control, it is as follows. If you have a, uh, a system um, and you have uh, snapshots of uh, your um, you know, simulation, let's call this uh, X, you can go through an encoder decoder framework, and I'm gonna show what I mean by these transitions in, in a minute, right? And you can get out of this A and B information of that. So it's a paper uh, you know, a couple of years ago that used that for reservoir simulation. And we thought, well, that's really nice, but we have if we don't have information about the output. So what we do with that output, right? Uh, one can reconstruct the output by going through a Pisman equation. That's great. But uh, if you have a uh, optimizing things that are closing and opening wells, that may not work too well. Okay, so what we've done, we took that uh, to one next level, and uh, we developed a uh, the E to C O and observe observe here, okay, um, in the following way. We now are creating not only A B and then in that uh, in that uh, you know equation here, but we're creating C and D as well as you go and train this net this network. So you go and create this network. So the, uh, just going a little bit uh, into details. I mean, the, the the network itself can it's in the paper, okay? But um, uh, one can uh, you know, create a uh, a network with transitions, input and out, uh, state and uh, output, whereby one look at uh, you know a, a series of uh, dense layers, batch normalization, ReLU, and they output A, B, C, and D. Okay, that's really nice. We tested, uh, you know, a small problem here with a training, with a uh, this particular, uh, you know, we have uh, several wells and a particular, uh, you know, uh, input to the system, right? And uh, you get a good, uh, really nice uh, uh, output uh, information here. Um, uh, I can go into details later on if you, if, you, if you want me to go through this, how we actually implemented this. But as far as the training goes, 
uh, if you have a good implementation of uh, you know, GPUs, in our case, this is a small system, it took us 38 minutes, right? Of course, I mean, if you go to some bigger, bigger problems, that for training purposes, that might be a uh, much larger uh, timing for, for training. But the nice thing is that uh, if you compare the high fidelity simulation here on the left with this E2CO, right? At least uh, visually speaking, uh, you can say there's a really good matching, right? But uh, as far as they uh, matching the well rates, um, that's even better, right? Uh, you can say that, uh, you know, the high fidelity simulation here is the, uh, the black one and the, uh, the green is the E2CO. And if you look at uh, the reconstruction, that's called proposition one here, the reconstruction of uh, using Pisman equation, um, it's a little bit far off. So we think that uh, our methodology, uh, it's a little bit better than just reconstructing the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the Pisman equation, right? And uh, especially when you open and close wells. Right. And uh, then we 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 handle we also run some statistics that so one can look at this uh, on the paper as well. And uh, E2CO always get a little bit better, uh, you know, running this many many times. I always get a better, uh, you know, error as compared to the uh, just uh, you know reconstructing by a Pisman equation. Okay, we took this a little bit farther and said, well, can we do a 3D model? Can we do a bigger model? And the answer is yes, but if you look at uh, you know 3D models that usually they have a uh, uh, no active grid blocks, right? Uh, the E2C or the E2CO cannot handle that in in, in some ways because you need a uh, you know some kind of square architecture or a rectangular architecture, right? But we are able to handle this uh, with a uh, partial convolution layers, right? And I can explain later on if, if it needs to. But here is a, a solution for this uh, egg model. Um, uh, with a uh, with a uh, our e ETCO, um, the, we have a paper in preparation that is going to show all the uh, demonstration here and uh, the timing. So um, uh, hopefully that will be published uh, soon as well. Okay. All right. So that's great. Uh, I spent maybe half an hour or so to talk a little bit about that. But let me move on to uh, you know issues that we encounter as doing ETCO, right? And uh, and uh, one of the issues was that exactly on the nonlinearities, right? And uh, as I said, uh, many times you get, uh, you know, things to work, many times you get things not to work, uh, especially uh, if you go from the uh, classical, uh, you know, uh, model reduction to a little bit on this uh, E2CO. And E2CO, by the way, it, it's, uh, it's, uh, if you look at the, uh, what the implementation is actually a trajectory piecewise implementation with a proper orthogonal decomposition embedded into it. So, but the, the, the proper orthogonal decomposition you get on uh, using this uh, encoder decoder uh, framework, right? So there's uh, still some issues with nonlinearities. And one way that we saw to solve the problem was to look back uh, what we've done, you know, maybe six, seven years ago on writing up a, uh, uh, the, the, the nonlinear equations uh, into a, what's called a bilinear form, okay? Back then, um, we wrote this bilinear form. What I mean by that, if you have a, a full order system here, the same way that we had before, we can write this up into this bilinear form right here, this bilinear form, which can get us a little bit better handling on the nonlinearities. The thing is that in, in when we published the paper, we wrote that uh, bilinearization by hand, okay? And as you're gonna see, uh, this nonlinearization or this bilinearization depend upon augmenting the states, right? So if you have states X to be order of N, Right? When we go to these states uh, here on the bilinear form, you are actually almost doubling the number of states, right? And back then, if you look at the paper, right, we are not able to solve much larger problems. I mean, we had a very toy example, was very nice theoretically what we wrote, but we hit at that time a wall, say, well, we cannot uh, proceed further. What happens in the last uh, five, six years was the development of this uh, notion of the coupon operator, right? The, the, uh, the, the deep neural net basic coupon operator. And I'm gonna show you in the next slide what a basically a coupon operator. And the coupon operator allows you to go to you know, this bilinearization in a much cheap, cheaper way, okay? 
And that's basically what we are proposing. We're proposing to go from a uh, uh, this nonlinear system through a coupon operator, writing it up as a uh, uh, bilinear form, and then operating on this bilinear form and creating projectors to do that, um, uh, this model reduction step. Okay. Of course, this is not so easy, right? Otherwise, uh, we'll be really happy, right? Um, and I'm going to show in the next uh, slides what uh, what issues we encounter doing that and how we actually fixed some of the issues. Okay. So, but anyway, so the the idea is actually writing up uh, a coupon operator to bilinearize the system, and then do projection uh, on the fly using uh, this projection matrices phi and psi. All right, so uh, Kuhlman uh, operator coupon theory is not new. It's something that uh, you know uh, was developed in the 30s, and basically it is uh, um, trying to write up this uh, new set of coordinate systems so that you can kind of somehow linearize the the, the, uh, the system, right? So you write this up into a, to a higher dimension state space. That you can see a linearization out of that. So here, an original manifold, and um, thanks to uh, the papers here by Nathan and and, and uh, Cuts and uh, Brunton, uh, that moved on from the, uh, the 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 theory, only the theory, to actually something more that's really efficient for computation. Okay, so we can go from the original manifold to a flat manifold using this Koopman uh, theory. Okay. And the classical example here, uh, not spending too much time, is actually uh, looking at this ODE. If you have this ODE, which is nonlinear, if you can find this operator psi here, um, whatever the operator is, right, and introduce this operator into your dynamical system, okay, one can look at the new equation here in the, the, the bottom, right, as a linear operator, okay, it's a linear operator. So that's basically the idea, right? But finding this function, finding this function, it is the, the hard thing. And that's what, uh, you know, prevented us from moving on from this paper to, to do something else with that, right? We didn't know how to do it, right? Um, so so how, does it, how does it work, okay? So imagine that you have a, a full simulation here. Right, and uh, you run the simulator uh, using your equations, what, 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 whatever you have, and then you save up the states. Okay, you save up the snapshots of the states. Okay, so what one does for determining the coupon operator, it is as follows: you take these snapshots, you run these snapshots through a series of networks here, deep learning networks. Okay, and not only that, you have a uh, encoding process here that you go from a high order space to low order space, kind of doing, doing a projection, right? If you look at uh, this encoding, it's basically doing a projection, okay? So you, you train this network using the states such that you find the Koopman operator, but at the same time, you find the projection matrices psi and fees here that we we're going to use to project the system okay of course you can look at uh, this is just a galerk galerk Gal process you can do petrov galerkin that's the same type of uh, of uh, uh, experimentation right but one goes to this network and train this network and find this fee and find this projection matrices that you have now a set of coordinates in the latin space and the a matrix is actually read, read up directly from this uh, network. Okay, so let, let me. So that's basically the the, the the coupon operator process, right? All right. So let, let me uh, show what we implemented. This uh, we start up with a very simplistic case with a buck leverett, right? Which is uh, uh, highly nonlinear, nonlinear in some sense, and has issues. Especially, you're going to try to apply this into the uh, physics-informed neural net framework, right? So here's our equation. Um, if, well, as I mentioned, if there's some work on the on the uh, trying to do this into the physics-informed neural net framework, right? And of course, I mean the classical approach for handling uh, in a buck collaborate is to add up 
this uh, artificial viscosity for stability purposes, right? So if you add up this stability uh, uh, parameter for, um, you, you can guarantee stability of this uh, this uh, book elaborate, right? Uh, this uh, you know, additional of a stability has been solved by, uh, uh, I think uh, having an, another, Another slide is a uh, uh, Fux and uh, and uh, Chalapi that uh, developed some uh, you know how to actually introduce this artificial viscosity, right? Using a pin, but here we try to solve using um, what we call a we, we turn this into a learnable learnable uh, parameter. So uh, I'm not going to do out too much. That's not the the point here. The point is that uh, you know uh, the the buckle leverage. Uh, has stability issues. One can fix using a learnable parameter, learnable viscosity, right? As you can see here, okay. You can see there's a, uh, you know, by using adaptive learn learnable viscosity, we can actually, uh, 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 you know, stabilize the system. But the using of, the the use of coupon operator can also stabilize the system. Okay. So here's the here's the the the, the solution. Okay, so if you use a uh, you know varying uh, boundary conditions using this framework for the coupon operator, right? One can actually stabilize the solution of this uh, buck labyrinth. Okay, so that gave us a little bit of hope on how to explore this for much uh, for single phase, two phase, and multi phase flow, right? And that's the solution here. And and by the way, so the if you look at just the uh, the buck labyrinth. Uh, I know the comparing, uh, you know, this may not be a fair comparison given that our proxy was done in a different framework, in a different uh, you know, platform. But just uh, look at uh, if you have a thousands of simulations of a book leverage, it may take uh, 1.2 hours. Uh, in our case, uh, using this uh, Kumban process, it takes uh, 2.3 seconds. So just uh, to keep this in, into perspective. Okay, so uh, now uh, going a little bit more for two-phase flow, right? Uh, we apply this for uh, you know going for two-phase flows here with uh, two producers and one injector, right? Um, and let me show a little bit what the uh, the issues were developing this for a much larger problem. Okay, as you're gonna see. Um, there are actually not only five. Oh, uh, this is part of the the, the training process that right? I, I think I forgot to mention. Right? How they actually train this? Right? Uh, you train by based upon a, a introducing loss functions into the process. Right? To guarantee some um, some matching of the states and outputs and other things. Okay. Um, as you're gonna see, the process is not yet uh, efficient in the following way. You still have lots of loss functions that we have to deal with, right? And not only five as you written up here, but we have actually the whole framework uh, is that actually eight loss functions, and we don't know what to do with them. Uh, you know, to be honest, right? How do you combine them up into a much much less number of loss functions? But the 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 idea here is, is that uh, on the training process, right? Uh, one introduce a loss function for the autoencoder. Right, that, that we want to, uh, you know, uh, match up the state. We also want to match up the uh, the the Koopman state and Latin space, right? And uh, we want to match up the prediction in X and and other things as well. Okay, so those are the loss functions that uh, one uh, has to guarantee to uh, to make this to to work. Okay, one issue that we actually we hit a wall. I mean, that was a Marcelo's de la Quatisis uh, here at a and uh, A year and a half ago, we hit the wall. So, well, we cannot do it. Why? Because, again, coming back to the problem of having controls and output, right? If you write this up the, for the coupon fu function for the uh, reservoir simulation equation, there's always a term here, right? And uh, it's a simplistic uh, you know, differentiation here, but there's a term. There is a non-linear in control that we know how to, we don't know how to handle that. Okay, so we started for non-linear system. We could potentially discover the the the, the coupon operator, but there is always going to be a non-linear function here that uh, cannot be discoverable. 
Okay, so at that time we hit the wall, like maybe a year and a half, two years ago, and all of a sudden Marcelo was very diligent and found a solution. Okay, and the solution was the following: there was a paper here, 2021, that talks about the following: if you have a system, a nonlinear system that is control affine, and what I mean control affine, if you can pull out the control U in this particular form, okay, the system can be bilinearized. Okay, that, that's the paper, that's basically what uh, the paper tells. If you have a system that is control, control affine, right, the system can be bilinearized. And how do you bilinearize? You apply this to the control, I mean, there's a process here in place, but basically what you find, instead of finding just A matrix, you find N and B matrix in this way. A, N, and B matrix, right here, okay? So that's exactly what we've done. We took that and we bilinearized based upon the guarantee that one can do that, given the fact that uh, reservoir equations are in this control-affine uh, way, okay? So here's the solution, uh, applying this uh, to a, a control-affine perspective and bilinearize the, with the controls. Here's the, the solution. Uh, using to, you know, again, uh, you know, at least uh, from, uh, you know, inspection, you can see that uh, uh, the the proxy model can handle really well the, the saturation fronts and everything, especially for varying well rates, okay, varying well rates. Okay. But that's that not necessarily the, the whole story because you might end up with a A matrix that it may not be necessarily stable, okay? And that's what I meant, that, that there are lots of uh, loss functions that we added up to make uh, this a little bit more uh, robust, okay? And one way that we handle this uh, uh, A matrix not to be stable, we basically said, instead of, let's, let's uh, the, the A matrix is a small matrix, right? It's, uh, it comes in the Latin, it's formed the Latin space, so it's a small matrix. So we can afford to calculate the eigenvalues. And what we do, if we have eigenvalues that are uh, outside of the unit circle, right, we clip them off, we clip them off. And luckily, that didn't happen too often, but there was a particular loss function that we introduced uh, to clip that, uh, or to, to guarantee that uh, you'd have a, a stable solution for the A matrix, okay? Again, remember what I mentioned, we have too many loss functions that we, we don't know yet how to combine them together, okay? But anyway, so uh, uh, if the system are stable then, they can see that uh, matching the results and the well locations are really good, okay? Uh, with errors, uh, you know, 0.4%, 0.1% uh, for water saturation and pressures, so we really give us uh, hope to do that, okay? Now, the second issue that we encounter, right, is as follows. That's great. We can do that, and I'm um, I'm about to stop here in a, maybe a couple more minutes. Uh, that's great. We can find these A, N, and Bs, but that depends upon how actually initialize the system. Okay, so given a seed for that training, uh, you know, it's a stochastic process. It depends upon the how we actually train. You may get uh, not so good results. Okay, so. We, we, Marcelo had a second uh, you know, uh, contribution here, was as follows. Why don't we use what we know already, which is a DMD, right? To initialize with a very few snapshots, we initialize A, N, and B, given already the, the you know, proper snapshots of the, the system, okay? So given proper snapshots of the system, okay, we can initialize the A, N, and B, okay, using this idea of a bilinear mode decomposition, okay? So the, if you look at the paper, one can look at uh, bilinearizations, right? And one can, uh, uh, you know, re create in a very uh, efficient way a very uh, uh, initial value for A, N, and B, okay? Yeah, I'm not gonna go into details on DMD, bilinear DMD, but one can do that. And uh, so what we call a stepwise training process. We, st we, we train the autoencoder, 
then we create, we're using a few snapshots of the states, we initialize A, N, and B, and then we, with that initial states, A, N, and B, we train uh, all together uh, for the final result. Okay, and as a comparison here, again, one uh, simulation, 45 seconds for that model, uh, and if you have a 320, and that was the, the data set that we had, it took us four hours in the uh, MRST, uh, but as opposed to 40 seconds in our, our framework with a really good uh, stable results and robust results. Okay, so some remarks here, and then I will close down. Um, things are, uh, you know, um, uh, entirely uh, built on uh, states and snapshots, and, uh, you know, we add up output information. Um, and we are able to reconstruct the surrogate uh, doing, um, you know, this idea of uh, uh, bilinearization, okay? One thing that we're working on at the moment, it is as follows. Uh, we can, you know, if you look at the control theory, right, the balanced truncation, it is actually a better model reduction, uh, you know, one can, for, for, at least for linear system, right? Balanced truncation, it is the way to go for if you have input and output. That's what our main objective. So what we are working on is actually translating this uh, the, in this uh, framework into this bi balanced truncation framework, okay? And, uh, and I'm gonna skip some of this, okay? And the balanced truncation framework is actually a, um, a something that looks at uh, controllability and observability, right? Um, it's really good for uh, linear systems. And basically, it translates to find these controllability functions, uh, P's, and observability functions, Q's, okay, that uh, uh, identify states that are easy to control and uh, observa observations that are difficult to, to measure. Okay, so if you, if you put this into two perspective, right, they're called Gramians, right? And uh, we, if you look at the equations, uh, one look at uh, how to calculate those gradients, right? But in the end, it turns out that for our case, for taking that uh, framework for doing balanced truncation, it's just a matter of adding warm or loss function, okay? Warm or loss function, which is uh, minimizing the trace of these two equations here, okay? Um, and we have a paper coming up that uh, talks about that. Right, uh, but basically uh, that's the uh, the solution here using balanced truncation, okay. Uh, and one can say that uh, you get uh, you know really good results with balanced truncation uh, anyway. So that uh, input output perspective uh, that can match really well input and output. Okay, so let me just conclude here. Um, we propose uh, you know transformation for a nonlinear system to more amenable form, E2CO, for piecewise linearizations, but in a form, uh, as I said, we have uh, used several loss functions, too many, to be honest, right? Uh, and uh, hopefully that we will be able to fix this in, uh, in the near future. But uh, the, the nice thing is that uh, we have the addition of the output information, which may be really important for some, some uh, uh, no, implementation and some applications, okay? Uh, as we speak, uh, you know, uh, uh, Marcelo had graduated, so I have another student now taking this up uh, one notch and doing this for CCS. So we're testing out to uh, a, a implementation for carbon capture. Uh, so hopefully uh, we're going to do that. And I uh, have another student uh, looking at uh, possibilities of using transfer learning when uh, boundary condition changes. Okay, so exactly when you when you open and close. Uh, wells, when you move well locations, uh, how we actually, if you want to do optimization for, or well location optimization, how actually one can handle this into our framework. And finally, uh, as I mentioned, I haven't tested uh, Libron myself, um, and I'm eager to, you know, get my hands dirty and uh, get uh, maybe some of this implementation into, into Libron. So with that, I'm going to finish here acknowledge some of my uh, collaborators as I mentioned in the beginning and some of the funding here. Um, and uh, I'm open for questions and answers and uh, anything that you wanna, wanna know from the, from, the, um, from the implementation. Thanks so much.
Yeah, thanks for the wonderful talk, Dr. Yudin. Uh, we truly look forward to the collaboration of using Libram on the digital twin, especially in the uh, subsurface applications. Yes. So, uh, now we don't have any questions in the chat room yet. Um, if the audience have a question, please raise your hand or feel free to amuse yourself. So uh, while we're waiting, um, I, I may ask some questions. So um, I'm curious about the potential challenges of applying, uh, say, the easy to approach to more complex or real realistic reservoir models like uh, compositional reservoirs or black oil models. So will the autoencoder be very difficult to train in such large state spaces? Yes, that's actually one of the uh, the main issues. I mean, the um, uh, the the training process is actually the main issue, right? I mean, uh, the it's, it's not necessarily the, the training process, but the, the the computational time involved in the training process, right? Uh, uh, we are testing some of, uh, of our framework for larger problems using the high performance computing here at AM. and um, And in the, so it takes several hours to do that, to do the training, right? So that's uh, something we're looking at the ways to reduce that timing. Um, but we, we I don't have a uh, I don't have a, a, a silver bullet to tell you uh, what to do. Right? Um, yeah. I see. So uh, just curious, I will, do you think the EC two or EC two O framework will work if we simply use linear compression in the state space? Because I mean, it is more easy to. Uh, so if you look at uh, you know linear compression, you meaning uh, like doing SVD. Yes, yes. Right, yes, yes. Um, yes and no, right? I mean, uh, uh, the autoencoder is actually a, uh, is an SVD framework, if you will, right? I mean, it's a, it's a POD-like, right? And uh, uh, we, we the, the classical approach uh, using POD, we've done that. And uh, we, we showed that we can do that. But again, um, it has robustness issues, right? And uh, the, the deciding on a number of uh, you know, reduced order states uh, is not necessarily, if you follow the recipe, like, you know, get the energy uh, function and the cut, uh, do a cutoff, that doesn't work for, for some reason, that doesn't work for a much more complicated problem, right? Uh, it, so I, I believe there's, there's, a, there's a much better way to, to do that, that I, I don't know, right? Okay. Uh, do we have a question? I can, I can ask questions. Yes. Yeah. Um, Please, you know, the framework you introduced, like first to the autoencoder and then uh, fit the latent space data into, you know, there's a specific form of the DMD um, in the later part of your talk. Right. I, I was wondering how you parameterize the framework, maybe I missed that part. Probably you explained that because you, you do have some parameter to tweak, right? I mean, there's a source locations or, um, you know, whatever the boundary conditions or initial condition, whatever you're changing, that your model has to be robust in parameter change. How, right, how you, right. How do you deal with that? Uh, I missed that. The, 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 the things that I presented here, uh, we have a fixed uh, fixed system, right? Um, what I haven't shown here is actually the, the, uh, the, the parameterization, right? Um, we uh, we don't have a, uh, we, we are working with, uh, you, you may know, uh, Jim Ragusa, yeah. Right, yeah. So, so we we are working with uh, John Ragusa to actually do this interpolation, uh, the parameterization interpolation, right? Um, and the the in the classical way of model reduction for for at least for reservoir simulation, uh, one can parameterize the um, you know uh, the, the well locations by looking at uh, distances, and we we had a paper you know a couple of years ago on doing that. Uh, it works uh, somewhat uh, well, right? Uh, but it's not it's not robust again, right? 
but we are hoping that uh, this collaboration with Jim Ragusa will uh, lead us uh, to a little bit better better way of uh, you know uh, the interpolation. Yeah, he he has he has published some parametric DMD framework mm -hmm. recently. Mm -hmm. uh, right. But you you may also want to check our recent paper on latent space dynamics identification papers. I can send two of those and both of them talking of talking about the uh the parameterization and also you know when you do the parameterization you need to sample um to 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 decide where um in the parameter space you need to generate the data so all, all those things um those two yeah, we'll, be, are... we'll be glad to take a look at yes yeah yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I can forward it to you yeah sure okay yeah uh sounds good so i don't see any more questions so um if that's the case, let's thank Dr. Gildian again for sharing his excellent research with us. Thanks so much. Thanks for the invitation, and I'll be glad to, to collaborate more.